I'm presenting just giving context to this research that MARTA has done. And uh, when this whole thing started, I worked for Central Federal Lands. And um, if you were at the 2016 NHEC, I did a presentation on innovations we did on some Colorado flooding that, uh, that Central Federal Lands did for CDOT. And Rockeries was part of that. So if you didn't see that, I'll give you a little refresher. Um, you can see some of the, dam well, this is some of the repairs we did. Uh, but the damage from the 2013 flood, they had a 1,000 year precipitation event and a 500 year runoff event a flood event. And it really happened in the foothills of the Rockies it, and went through steep canyons where there were roads. So any place a road was on the outside of a bend, it, got, it just got obliterated. And you can see here we had uh, roadway embankments that were taken out sometimes for miles. And we also had um, bridge foundation failures there. So CDOT was overwhelmed with work when all this happened. And, they asked Central Federal Land to take care of, this shouldn't be Colorado 36, it's actually State Highway 36 and Colorado 43. So because um, we were trying to make the roads more resilient up in these canyons, they wanted to raise the, the height of the roadway. And to do that, they need a roadway embankment that would have cut off the stream. So the thought was, what can we do to um, provide resiliency to these roads and still give the uh, um, streams, a lot of floodplain or more floodplain in the canyons. So the idea came about that maybe we could use rockeries. And for those of you who don't know what a rockery is, you can see it in the picture there. It's just a dry stack wall, basically. But um, there's no, and the rocks are stacked in an interlocking fashion with no mortar or concrete. It's just dry stack. And there is gravel behind this wall. So it's, it's not just arbitrarily stacked rock, it's actually designed. And the geotechs do this, they have a program, they take account of all the forces, the gravity coming down on the top, lateral forces, poor pressure, and the overturning forces. So they design these walls and they've been putting them up, Federal Lands has been putting these up for at least 10 years on roadways to hold back that cut or fill slope. Um, and it's been working really well. So the thought is, could we do this in a river environment? Well, we thought it was a great idea, but we didn't know what those hydraulic forces were. So Bart Bergendahl, who was with us at the time and working on this, he got together with Cornell at the lab and gave, provided the hydraulic forces that were in these areas that we wanted to protect with the rockeries. And Cornell got in touch with Argonne National Labs and Marta was the one who had the pleasure of working on this preliminary research for us. So these are just some of the um, variables that Scott provided. And you can see that the angle of attack is mostly parallel to the wall. And they had one 20 degree angle of attack on the wall. So Marta p did a great job for this specified um, problem that we had, specific problem. And she developed those models that she will get into and, and talk to you about. Um, and I'm just showing this so you can see some of the results from one or two rocks on the first layer. So after all of this, and we went on to use it in some of the areas in uh, the Colorado flooding. But a after all that project was done, uh, Federal Lands was like, this is such a great idea. Um, Kamis uh, Harami, who is the geotech engineer at Central, loved the idea and so did I. So we, uh, Federal Lands combined resources with the hydraulics, um, National Hydraulics team, and headquarters and Federal Lands put our resources, resources together to provide research money. So Argonne could really look into this and give us um, a better idea of exactly where we can use it, how far we could go with it, um, and just start using it as a part of our um, design process. So we think we can use this not only in river environments like this, in steep canyons, but if you have a meandering channel that takes out a roadway embankment, that's a great place for it. In future, we may be looking at um, the geotechs thought it would be a great place uh, for it on the coast to protect roadways along the coast, but we haven't done that research and hopefully we will in the future. It just depends on money. So. Um, these were the research objectives that we gave to MARTA for subsequent research. 
and it was really to figure out those driving forces um, lateral and take into account lateral earth pressure, the surcharge pressure, and the hydrodynamic and surface shear stresses on the wall. So, um, and I just want to stress this is not built for seismic loading, so it's just uh, in that river environment. So with that, I will turn it over to uh, Marta, and she can tell you about it. Uh, one thing I forgot. <laughs> um, we are so heartened and optimistic about this research that Federal Lands is going to be incorporating um, the hydrodynamic forces into their rockery design program. Uh, uh, Central Federal Lands will be doing that, and Western Federal Lands plans to use it on projects, and they're going to be developing the construction specs that you need to develop. Uh, put these walls up. So look for that within the year, and we're hoping maybe in six months we'll have that, and we'll put it out in a newsletter for you so you can access um, that information. So, Marta. Good, yes, good morning, everybody. I would just love to, um, and I have to give credit to two of my coworkers who uh, worked on the initial phase of the study with um, Stephen Lotus and Cesare Boyanovsky. They did uh, the, all of the work with the initial uh, with the initial modeling, and then I just took over uh, um, from them. And now um, it's been uh, mostly me and Stephen Lotus. So, what do our models look like? Uh, on the left side of the slide, you can see the a real rockery. Uh, uh, you saw the um, top picture before on Veronica's slides. On the right side, you can see examples of our models. So we have all of those rocks modeled. We have the backfield, which is a granular, uh, granular backfield. We do have a channel of a certain um, shape. It can be straight, it can be curved, uh, or rather with a bend. And it is filled with um, water. And our parametric matrix uh, considered a few variables. So we do have different, um, let's start maybe with showing. Okay. Um, so we do have a, a different um, base widths. We have, uh, we kept one height of the rockery, but we were changing the um, water level height. So we have a few cases for water level, which is lower than the uh, rockery height, and we have two cases for um, overtopping flow. We are also considering different geometries of the rockery, meaning the phase batter changes uh, from uh, a rockery that's almost uh, a vertical wall to something with a slope. We are checking also different um, channel bed widths, um, and therefore we have different um, flow velocities. Um, so we were, differ uh, we were changing the uh, geometry of the rockery and the channel and also uh, the hydraulic conditions. And like I uh, mentioned before, we considered a straight rockery and a channel with a bend. And what we are after are those, um, what we call them driving forces, meaning hydrodynamic forces that would uh, that would cause or could pose a risk for a rockery and uh, would cause it to, to fail. So what we're looking at are two failure mechanisms, um, which is sliding and overturning. And like Veronica mentioned, the, the equations for uh, checking those, uh, these two criteria are already in the guidelines, FHWA um, guidelines. And we just needed to add those hydrodynamic forces to the equations. So again, what we're looking at here is um, just uh, mm, half of the channel, so you can see the rockery. We're looking at the FHD forces, which are hydrodynamic forces. We are also checking the vertical forces, which in river environment uh, means gravity and buoyancy. Um, and you can see here uh, at, like a front view uh, onto the rockery. So you can see that every single uh, rock is uh, modeled. They differ uh, in size and shape as well because we wanted to 
make the study as detailed as possible, see what the forces would look like for different kinds of uh, rocks. And the forces, the hydrodynamic forces, are basically calculated as um, uh, by integrating uh, the pressure acting on um, every single rock. And then they are averaged along the length of the rockery so that we can get um, a force per unit uh, length. What you can see here on this plot are, um, it's just an example um, of what the hydrodynamic forces could look like for uh, separate, um, separate rocks. For, it, for one of the conditions that we considered. So you can see, for example, that these highest forces are for this rock and, and this rock. And even though they're, let's say, rock number four in the fourth layer is very similar to, um, to the previous one in, in shape, the, um, the force can drop. So what we notice is that usually for bigger rocks, we will get bigger forces, higher forces, but sometimes um, because they are, um, one rock is shielding the other one, the force can drop or the force can increase. So it's a very, um, it was um, really hard really to find some kind of a, a correlation because it all depends on uh, in which layer um, of rocks the rock is, uh, what is its rock, uh, location relative to the other rocks. But so we still, so we tried to average um, in, in uh, the length direction, at least. And so the distribution, the vertical distributions of the forces that we got, um, these are, again, uh, just example plots. We noticed that um, for the batter 4 to 1, um, the most, uh, the biggest force is always on layer number 2. So it's first, second, third, and so on layer. Uh, when it comes to an almost vertical wall, uh, the distribution changed a little bit, and then the uh, maximum force was um, acting on the fourth layer. But what you can also notice is that this distribution is almost constant. Only the first layer of rocks and the um, top layer are um, exposed to um, lower forces, um, so we were thinking that probably the most the best way to do it would be just to take um, an ever a constant value of forces for all of those um, layers. But of course, that still can be uh, decided otherwise. Um, and um, so um, what I was, uh, what you're looking at here are two different cases of uh, water level on the left side you have all of those water levels that we were talking that I was talking about that are lower than the rockery height and on the right side the water is overtopping the rockery on the vertical axis uh, you can see the hydrodynamic forces per unit per one foot per unit length and on the horizontal axis it's the channel width so here you can see all of those points are results from um, one simulation. For each of the layers, uh, we averaged those uh, forces, plotted it on, <coughs> excuse me, on those combined plots. And as you can see, it would be really hard probably for a designer to use these plots. So later on, I will be talking about something that we came up with uh, that could be of um, of interest and could be a design, regarded a design aid. But first, uh, one numerical example, because I wanted to show you how those um, equations uh, for the stability criteria, they change. And so what we do here is in sliding assessment, uh, sliding failure assessment, <clears throat> we have three uh, components. We have the active pressure for, from um, the, the soil behind the rockery, we have the surcharge load, and we have that additional component, which is hydrodynamic forces. And in the, oh, and this is the driving force, so the force that's uh, pushing the uh, rockery uh, out, and the force that's uh, resisting force, which is the friction. Here in this case, I took the force on the bottom of the uh, rockery, 
and its components uh, are the W, that's weight of the uh, rockery, and uh, the vertical component from active um, soil pressure. So what you can see here is that our hydrodynamic forces, or our addition to the equation, uh, doesn't really um, doesn't change much, doesn't increase uh, the overall uh, force uh, by much, but what's going on is that if we take into account that, like in this particular case where uh, the water flow was 12 feet with a, a 13 feet rockery height, all of the rocks are submerged and therefore their weight is decreased. If we have a case of a lower flow, then of course we would take into consideration uh, that only part of that weight is uh, decreased by buoyancy and the other part, the top part not submerged, uh, will, be, uh, will still have the um, dry weight that we would uh, use in the equation. And therefore, um, what we noticed is that um, First, we have an increase of the, um, of the driving force, but we also have a um, decrease of, um, of um, the resisting force. And in this case, it, it's, really, it's really important to uh, think about the rock size, the rock weight, and um, take this into account in, when designing a rockery in river in my environment. And for the overturning, um, I'm running out of time, so uh, th these are the equations uh, this time we're um, comparing the resisting moment versus the, the driving or, or overturning moment. And also, I have to point out that um, these factors, the 1.5 and uh, 2, these were the safety factors which were, um, which were established by uh, FHWA for um, dry conditions. Um, we are leaving this part uh, of establishing um, what the safety factors should be to FHWA again. Um, we don't. That's uh, we we just don't want to do it ourselves, <laughs> really. Um, so for all of these conditions, hydraulic geometrical conditions, we checked the what would be uh, the outcome of the stability analysis. Is it um, um, are the criteria met or not? And what you can see here is again only an example of a few cases in which. Uh, all of the cases, uh, in all of the cases, the uh, rockery was stable. The N means that rockery is stable, but um, the, the criteria uh, was not satisfied, meaning the, um, the ratio of the resisting to driving forces was less than the safety factor, which was applied for dry rockeries. Um, so what we came up with, what I, was, uh, what I mentioned before, is a lateral force coefficient. So uh, we were looking for some kind of a correlation that we would uh, we could give to um, uh, to to engineers that would be of of any use that we could give some kind of a chart that they could use in the design process. So the way we could do it is uh, the this is a like the overall total combined chart for all of those cases that we were just uh, looking at. Uh, the <clears throat> Maybe I will go back just, um, the lateral force coefficient is just defined as twice the uh, lateral force divided by density of water, mean velocity flow squared, and rockery layer height. And these were plotted against, because this is a non-dimensional uh, parameter, um, we wanted to find something that would be a non-dimensional parameter on the bottom, geometrical, so we came up with um, this distance from the rock layer to the center of the um, channel. And so if you have a certain uh, geometry of the channel and of the rockery, uh, you calculate D over H, and you can uh, establish from this kind of a chart what is the uh, lateral force coefficient, and therefore, um, back calculate the force. Um, we're again looking at other correlations. So here, for example, you can see a correlation uh, between the um, coefficient and Reynolds number. And on the right side, I was playing with the, uh, again, with the axis. You, you have a log-log um, scale, and we got a, uh, almost a linear um, 
fed. So with the channel, with the bands, what happens is that the flow is very, is not as uniform as it was in the straight channel. Therefore, we chose only a few um, rocks that we were looking at, and we've noticed that at some points, in some points, uh, especially in this location um, of the channel, we were getting much higher forces, and for the channel with a 60 degree, degree bend um, around this location, uh, we got an increase of about of almost six um, six times uh, as compared to the straight channel results. So, in conclusion, uh, we uh, we run the simulations for straight and um, straight channels and channels with a bend under different uh, hydraulic conditions. And we were considering uh, lower um, water levels and overtopping of the rockery. And what's uh, important is that you have to take, uh, while analyzing this kind of a structure, uh, hydraulic static and dynamic forces acting on the, uh, on the rocks and on the structure itself. They can vary uh, due to the position uh, in the rockery, size of the rocks, and flow conditions. And it's also important to uh, remember that the weight of the rocks will decrease in water, which will um, result in a decrease of the resisting force. And uh, also that we came up with that non-dimensional lateral force coefficient that uh, could be used as a um, design aid for engineers. And that's it. Thank you. Absolutely. In all of these uh, models, we have also flow behind the rocks. And therefore, we are getting those driving forces. If you just create a wall boundary condition behind it, there is no flow, there is no... And it's not realistic. We wanted it to be as realistic as, it, as possible. Uh, did you create some sort of pressure distribution? No, we didn't. We didn't have to it. Uh, we, again, uh, CFD modeling, so we used uh, inlet and outlet boundary condition for it. Uh, so we didn't have to make any other assumptions. Okay, I was wondering um, if about driving flows in that gravel uh, due to pressure distributions behind the rockery. The, there is flow behind the rockery, yeah. yes. 